Well, hello and welcome everybody to our Bush Broadcast Summer Webinar. My name is Matthew Taylor and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Guy Mary Eagle country that I'm sitting on today and also acknowledge the traditional owners and First Nations peoples on all the land that Bush Heritage works on. Um, this is our last webinar of the season. And as usual, we will be having some Q&A at the end. Um, so as we go through, please do put your questions into the chat function and we'll have time at the end to respond to that. So we're approaching the end of the year and we're gonna reflect on the year that was with its droughts and flooding rains for you Dorothy McKellar fans and also look at what next year is gonna bring. We'll be talking about some of the big highlights, big moments, some conservation wins and of course, who better to do that with than our CEO, Heather Campbell, and our Executive Manager, Science and Conservation, Dr. Rebecca Spindler. So welcome and thanks for joining today. Okay, well, I think the important thing that happened last year in my mind was we launched a big strategy, the 2030 strategy. It's a pretty ambitious plan to deepen and double our impact. And one of the big pillars of that plan is to double the amount of land we directly own, something that a great many of our supporters are very keen on. And we certainly kicked off the year in a big way, adding five new properties and creating a lot of uh, improved connectivity um, around our reserves, filling in the gaps. So Heather, it'd be great if you could give us a quick overview on those properties and any updates that we have on the early work being undertaken on them. Great. Look, thank you so much, Matthew. And it's so fantastic to be able to be here with everybody today. And I know we've got hundreds of you from around the globe all dialed in. And I'd like to start by paying my respects to the traditional owners on the land of where I'm sitting today, which is the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And just share with you before I reflect on these properties, the joy of actually seeing individuals. I'm in the office today, which is why I've got the headset on, and we're packed. We've got so many people that have come in and it's great to be able to connect in with people and share the stories. And so one of the exciting things, as Matthew mentioned, was that ability to add some really important properties to our portfolio. So if I look at the properties, that, and I'll just go through three of them, which are really exciting, and I've been lucky enough to visit those three this year. So the first property that I went to, um, or that we um, added, was one at Eddie Garrett. Now, this is a 1,000 hectare property. It's in the Fitzsterlings, and it's a really important connector from our Red Mort Reserve. And a month ago, I was able to stand there in an area of the pristine bush on Eddie Garrett. And as you can see from this photo, this, you know, a small pristine area sort of in the, um, the, the bottom right corner of that and to stand at the top of that and look down towards Red Mort and to imagine how we can reconnect that landscape. So over the coming years, we'll be doing a lot of restoration work on that property to build in the biodiversity that's needed so that we can actually have species then continue to move through that amazing corridor. So it was fantastic to be able to be there and see that vision come alive of connecting the Stirling Ranges and the Fitzgerald River. And this is a, probably a little depressing photo when people look at it and go, oh, that doesn't look like a Bush Heritage mm -hmm. property, but it's a photo of possibility. So this is the area of the property which had previously been wheat fields, and it provides that opportunity for us to restore it and get that connectivity with the biodiversity that we want. And this, we're just going to share a few of these images as we go through. So it gives a bit of a sense of, of Eddie Garrop and the way that we can actually connect in with the other properties that we have. And of course, that's looking towards the Stirling Ranges, which is always a wonderful vision to have when you're standing on the reserves. And I think what is so important with these reserves is we know that when we get the restoration work right, then we have things like mallee fowl, pygmy possums, honey possums, all coming back into that area. And there's nothing like the joy mm -hmm. of opening a nest box and finding a glorious little pygmy possum um, and doing that little squeal and the little dance when you see its little head pop up. So mm -hmm. that's the excitement that we've got to look forward to. The other properties that we added to the group during the year, one of the ones that was really important there was a very small property, but one called Glover's Flat. And the property there is it's the, the connector between our Dry's Bluff, one of those original properties down in Tassie and Aura Aura which has got the house that, that Bob Brown gifted to us. So the opportunity to connect in that landscape, to connect back up 
into the World Heritage Area, which is too good an opportunity to miss. So we've acquired that and it's beautiful forest, absolutely stunning area that we've been able to connect up. And these are just a few of the images of the amazing tall trees, the rocky outcrops. So we'll be managing that as a group of reserves together. One of the other areas that we've always looked to reconnect is in the Karakara Wedderburn down in Victoria. And so we had the opportunity to pick up a block called the John Douglas block. And that's part of connecting up that area from around a bit south of St Arnold, all the way up through to Wedderburn. And so this block is fantastic. It has, you know, um, yellow gums, it has box iron barks, it's, it's a grassy woodlands, amazing uh, forest birds that you can find and a whole lot of really little wonderful orchids. So again, this was a great property to help build those connections. So just three examples, Matthew, but an absolutely wonderful time and great to be out walking on those properties and seeing the possibilities. Yes, well, I certainly know what you mean about Eddie Garrop. I was there a few weeks ago and saw the stark contrast between one of those uh, arable fields, uh, almost completely bare with nothing in it, and right next door, some of the amazing work that's uh, been done to restore the Mali vegetation there. And it was astounding what you can do. I've never seen such good restoration before. So looking seven to 10 years ahead, I think that's going to be a magnificent stretch of countryside. So I share your joy. And I did get a peek at a possum as well. <laughs> it is glorious. <laughs> Well, listen, another big focus for us is partnering with pastoralists. And this is one of our newer endeavors, um, but it's critical because of the amount of land that pastoralists are stewards of. And a lot of them are now talking to us about how can we help them protect biodiversity and improve their income. Can you tell us a bit more about this exciting work, Heather, and how we're bringing together our landscape management expertise and contributing to agriculture? Look, thank you, Matthew. And this is the area that we've been developing. And people might say, oh, this is a bit new. Well, it's not really for us hmm. because we've had 10 years of the Midlands Conservation Fund, which has been in partnership with the Tasmanian Land Conservancy. So we've been out there and there's a great image here of, of Matt Appleby, our ecologist, you know, out there in the Tassie Midlands, helping those sheep farmers to understand the grasses that they've got and how to protect them as well as get the productive outcomes from a wool perspective. So it was great this year to be able to celebrate with our staff, Tasmanian Land Conservancy and the Midland Farmers, our 10 years, which is a brilliant celebration. As part of that, that's given us the skill and confidence to be able to step into the space of working with other pastoralists about how they can protect the landscapes that they've got, the species that they've got, really look at their soil health, really understand from an accounting perspective, like accounting for nature, be able to build those methodologies into how they manage their properties. So we've got a range of programs. One of them is um, building on the Farming for the Future, which is a, a partnership with the MacDoc Foundation and looking at helping to do those natural capital accounting processes for landholders. We have a couple of small projects uh, in Victoria, and then we have a couple of big ones. So there's a property in the Northern Territory where we've just been doing the analysis work across the property and doing like a rapid assessment to determine what's the biodiversity we've got. Now this property is five and a half thousand square kilometers. So it's big. And another one, which is near Mount Isa, which is 10,000 square kilometers. So working across those landscapes, utilizing our ecological skills to really help the landholders understand what's the vegetation they've got. And then what you know fauna does that actually support and how might they protect and how might they operate different parts of their properties in different ways to protect that biodiversity that they've got. So really exciting stuff in a range of different landscapes. Yes, it's fantastic, isn't it, Heather? And um, it's great to see that we're uh, exploring new avenues of how we can actually partner with these pastoralists to uh, improve their management of the land. Now, I forgot to say at the beginning, but uh, fortunately, our wonderful um, uh, attendees are already doing it. Please do contribute where you're calling from today, because it's lovely to see which country you're calling from. And if you do know who the traditional owners are, please acknowledge that. So moving on to the third sort of area that is one that we don't always talk about quite so much, but is critically important. Um, there's been a lot of developments in the environment and conservation space at a national level um, this year. We've had the State of Environment report. 
we've got the new federal government passing climate change legislation. And just last week, there was an announcement of some environmental law reform. And that's a question we often got asked. What, how do you get involved? What do you do? Does Bush Heritage have a say in that? So, Beck, I know that uh, you've been involved in this a lot, and it's a way that we share our expertise in these high-level discussions and consultation. Can you tell us a bit about some of the exciting things you've been talking about and engaging with this year? Yes, thanks, Matthew. And hello, I'm also so sitting on what is, was, always will be Camarega land, so we could wave at each other. We're not too <laughs> far away from one another. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Yes, this is a really exciting development for this year. Um, I think the, the changing government has really spurred a lot of consultation around um, how they want to move forward with the EPBC review, which was um, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which is Australia's only federal legislative tool, really, to protect the environment. Um, last year, Dr. Professor Graham Samuel undertook a really extensive review of the EPBC Act and put forward a lot of recommendations. And um, the, this government is really taking that by the horns, implementing the full review of nature, Australia's nature laws to make sure that they're more effective and make sure that we can stem the loss that we see every single year. We see more species coming onto the threatened species list. We see declines of many different populations. There are wins as well, but the general trajectory is really quite poor. And having that review as such a solid framework to be able to implement changes that we all need to implement to make sure that we're tipping the balance in terms of nature, giving, giving nature that chance to really turn the tide from what we've been seeing. And I'm really encouraged by the collaborative approach, not just with government, but amongst all of the conservation NGOs and, and many different entities and academics as well, working together for the genuine greater good around developing systems that are going to work incredibly well for, for the nature reform, for a biodiversity certificate scheme that might incentivise positive actions towards protecting biodiversity, regional planning that really puts First Nations voices at the front to make sure that we're accessing that knowledge and respecting and, and protecting that knowledge as we design new ways forward so that we can remain viable viable from an economic point of view, but also from an environmental and cultural point of view, making sure that whatever it is that we're doing as a society is genuinely sustainable. And I know that's a buzzword and lots of people throw hmm. it around, but fundamentally it just means that we can keep doing what we're doing forever because it's the resources that we're using are not going to run out having that sustainability built into all of the decisions that we make as a society is going to be really really clear and keen and profoundly required and I've been really encouraged so far about that level of um, cooperation with the government and, and with all of the NGOs we're all marching to the same beat and I, I have great optimism that we're actually going to find a way forward that, that really turns our society and, and demonstrates a model, I think, for lots of other countries to follow as well. Well, thanks, Beck, And it is always exciting to know that we are quietly influencing the wheels that are turning in government. And, and uh, certainly the future seems a bit brighter at the moment, doesn't it, that it has for the past few years. Yeah, and I'm particularly encouraged by Minister Plibersek's love of data. She loves data. And data, of course, we all know is very close to Bush Heritage's heart. We need the right data telling us the right thing at the right time. And um, Minister Plibersek is well and truly across that. Um, we, we geek out <laughs> every time we're in a meeting together. It's really <laughs> I have been hearing good things. But about her so um that's wonderful well thank you for that uh, update and roundup um now another thing that i know has been uh, very exciting this year to hear about and and heather this has been you leading this uh, campaign i think is engaging at an international level and national in other ngo groups and first nations people and i believe you had quite a good trip to the us um this year and have also hosted a bit of a delegation back here can you tell us a bit about what those adventures were? Because uh, I think they're they're uh, leading the way for a, a much bigger international engagement for us. 
Great. Look, thank you, Matthew. And it was really uh, fantastic to be able to get on a plane and go over to the US and engage with our donors and supporters in the US, which is beautiful. And a big shout out, and this is a great photo here of, of, of Jennifer uh, smith Grubb and her husband, who hosted an event for us in Santa Cruz. We were able to engage with supporters there in the US and have conversations and particularly around cultural burning and the importance of fire. So as well as myself that got on that glorious 15 hour flight, which I must admit, I you know haven't missed that. Um, but once you're over there, it's fantastic to be able to um, engage and have the conversations. So this photo is of some amazing young leaders in um, cultural burning practices in the US. And in the middle there is Vicky Parsley. Vicky is one of our Aboriginal Partnerships Managers from New South Wales. And it was such a joy to see her and the other leaders working together. And the gentleman on the end is an elder from the Esalen tribe, Tom Littlebear. And just the warmth and sharing that occurred between the different traditional owners, the First Nations people, and the similarities with why we utilize fire the way we do and the importance of it. It was just, it was an absolute joy to be able to have that engagement. And we held this event in um, the Arboretum, in the Botanic Gardens there at Santa Cruz. And there's an Australian part of it. And so just outside of the door was this beautiful snow gum. And Vicky mm. sat underneath it and had that feeling of, you know, I'm away from home and this tree's away from home, but we're here together. And to be able mm. to have that connection. And as well as being able to have events like this, we, you know, we traveled around the country and engaged with quite a few of our supporters, but we also went up onto a fire line. So this is up in Europe country and the far sort of north of California, almost on the border. And this is a team of um, firefighters from around the country and they call it a trex. So it's a training exchange. And so they've got this very narrow window and effectively they were there for a week doing prescribed burning um, so they could then introduce more cooler uh, cultural burning into the landscape. So we spent the whole day there really learning heaps about how they do it, sharing knowledge, sharing the exchange. And I can see that there'll be a, a suite of the team from over there coming mm -hmm. over and I had to laugh. They said to us, when's your fire window? And we said, well, it's July till about December, depending on where you are in the country. Whereas for them, they have a maximum of a two week window. Um, so no matter what the weather is, that's the only window they've got. So it's it's quite different, but there's also a whole lot of similarities. So I'm looking forward to hosting a number of them here and for us to continue the conversations. Of course, you can imagine this is Vicky here going, oh, please, can we have one of these? Um, <laughs> they had amazing, you know, fire trucks all set up with all of the equipment and We've been so lucky to have support, particularly out of the US and some large foundations to uh, equip some more of our um, equipment. But needless to say, our four wheel drives are not quite the size of what they have in the US uh, and they are pretty spectacular. A bit like the redwoods that we were able to see, they are amazing trees that just seem to go on and on forever. So to be able in, to be in that country, to share stories, to listen, to learn, to just stand in the landscape and see that there's so much similarity in what we're trying to do on either side of the Pacific uh, as we face the same challenges with climate change. So it was absolutely magical. Then of course, we were lucky enough to be able to host a group over here. So there was a group of conservation leaders from the US who came to Australia on, a, on an exchange, looking at how we can work more closely together to support the work around the globe. And so this is the, the team who are all standing up at the Roundhouse. So our property just north of Melbourne and learning about the really great things that are on this property and the importance of a fragmented landscape and how we can reconnect it. And so to be able to work together again, to share the stories, to be in the landscape. And there's been constant emails and phone calls since then connecting in different people, whether it's with science ideas and solutions or whether it's with funders, but just ways that we can all actually leverage from each other's support to grow the impact, protecting all species on the planet. So it's been a great time. As you can see, Melbourne did its typical weather when they were here with us. Mm -hmm. um, it was a bit cool, but it was great to be able to be out in country walking with them. Well, that is lovely to uh, hear. And um... 
it's certainly one of the things that um, we've noticed in our fundraising and philanthropy side that there is an increasing interest in what's happening in Australia from overseas. So it's wonderful um, that we're getting some funding coming from the US and other parts of the world. And in fact, one of the comments made in the chat was it'd be great if some of Australia's wealthy people could support the cause and put some funds into buying this sort of fire equipment. And I can reassure that person, I don't know who it is because it's only showing us admin, that they do and we do get people who are very happy to specifically fund fire trucks, fire trailers, equipment and the more the merrier. So if anybody feels a desire to buy a monster fire truck, please do let us know. <laughs> It might be too big for Australia, just like those American vehicles. I'm not sure they fit on our roads or our fire trails. However, moving on, um, you talked about the relationship with uh, traditional owners and First Nations people, and we encapsulate a almost all the work we do within a right way science approach to underpin the expertise and collaborative approach of blending knowledge and systems and traditional First Nations experience. Um, now, the challenge, of course, is that this year and for the last couple, we've had a sequence of floods and droughts and general disasters because of, you know, the third La Nina weather pattern, plus um, an unfolding climate crisis. So we've really hit some really extreme temperatures and rainfall. However, we often get asked, does that have an effect on our reserves on landscapes? And uh, with the sort of suspicion that it probably does. And our work plans do get interrupted quite considerably when you can't get out. But perhaps, Beck, you can give a nice idea of the bigger picture of uh, that sort of impact and also how we have to adjust to that, you know, because everybody's going to have to adapt to the changing weather patterns that are getting more severe. Perhaps you can talk to us about how we address that inevitable shift in our work approach. Sure. Thanks, Matthew. Um, the first thing to say is that my heart goes out to everyone who has been profoundly affected by the floods. Certainly, we've had a number of staff that have been affected, not just once or twice, but up to six times, really profoundly impacted by where they live in their townships with the floods. So um, uh, my sympathies go out to everyone who are feeling um, helpless and out of control because of the floods. I have to say, across a natural landscape like those that Bush Heritage manages, so far this is part of the cycle. Um, and, and you quoted Dorothy McKellar at the at the lead off to this webinar, Matthew. And it's so fitting. We we live in and work in boom and bust scenarios. And I have to say, um, across those natural landscapes where water is allowed to flow and seep into the landscape and really generate life, it has largely been an enormous bonus for us. Mm -hmm. We have had some challenges, obviously, with staff being able to move around, um, as I say, many staff that are impacted in their homes if they're not living on reserve. The greatest damage really has been to tracks and the roads um, that are out on reserve and making sure that we're really taking the greatest care with ourselves and our visitors and contractors and students and everyone who comes on site to make sure that we're not tearing up any of that country as we drive out because obviously it's much more fragile as it becomes sodden um, and you can do that much more damage. So really teaching people how to drive appropriately when it's just not okay to come on country or even to leave country. We have had a few of our staff stranded and had to airlift some lettuces in uh, to a couple of those very remote stations <laughs> where it was just impossible to get off for quite some time. But as I say, while my heart does go out to those people who are stranded and have been profoundly impacted, this is well and truly the, the great time for those natural landscapes across Bush Heritage. In many ways, it's our scorecard uh, where we do have the, the bust periods where we don't have rain for years and even decades. It's very difficult to tell how we're doing when you haven't got a great abundance of vegetation out on site because the, the water simply isn't in the landscape. You don't know what's under there in terms of the seed stock. When the rains come, that's when we get our scorecard. That's when we understand what the seed stock is there and what's generated. And just the amazing sense of hope and awe, really, when you see those landscapes rebound and come back to life and you think, understand vegetation, 
that's coming back from seed stock and, and so much of the care in keeping weeds down and making sure that when the rains do come, it does come into and, and penetrate that soil and doesn't just run off and, and they're not laminated soils. But where have the animals been? You know, we've seen so many animals come back onto, onto reserve in a really obvious way. We've actually observed them. We've noticed many animals for the very first time. Um, some of the, the things that we've seen, which is just so heartening, is um, a couple of uh, frogs, the southern sandhill frogs. We've seen, really, for the first time out on Edgebaston Reserve um, by our ecologist. The eastern sign-bearing froglet was noted for the first time by the magnificent Jody Rowley at the Australian Museum from one of our ecologists uploading the call um, on, on reserve. That's 200 kilometres east, uh, west, sorry, of its known range. So we may have actually extended the known range of this species. Um, we have a number of other species, platypus out on Scottsdale noticed for the first time, really recorded for the first time. We think they probably have been there, but coordinating our observation um, events with the, the, the perfect conditions for the platypus to be noticed, I think was absolutely fantastic. And of course, we were able to play a really significant role in a population redistribution effort. So in working with um, the Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions in WA and AWC took some western grass wrens from Hamlin Station um, out near Shark Bay, our property out near Shark Bay, and put them out onto um, um, the, the island that <laughs> I've hmm. temporarily forgotten the name of. <laughs> Dirk Hartog, um, I think it is, isn't it? Thank you, Dirk Hartog. Sorry, recovering from COVID. I still have COVID <laughs> brain. Um, Dirk Hartog Island. And so after a population viability analysis, we determined the number with Arlene uh, Vegas here, one of our, our students and working with our ecologist, Michelle Hall, understood what the population level was that Hamlin could sustain. So we took nearly half of the population, half of the 85 that were translocated out onto Dirk, Dirk Hartog Island. And we think that's now enough for a self-sustaining population. We may need to supplement for genetics down the track, but early results are really promising for, for things like this. So it's through these bus times that we're really able to, A, understand where we are, but also come back and, and take some innovative approaches and give back to um, other areas and, and properties where we might have shared um, their, their abundance of species previously. I think it's worth thinking too, though, as we start moving into El Nino, and I know the, the Bureau of Meteorology is, is having that shift sitting just um, on the precipice at the moment. It's likely that we'll be moving into El Nino and that brings the dry. We are working really hard already to understand what that means for us and our properties already. What does it mean to go from a, a, an abundance of three years of really lovely rain and then to go into what is likely to be quite a sudden dry. We will probably still have rain, but we'll have rain in, in significant bursts in storms. That has a lot to, to do um, with our erosion. It might exacerbate our erosion. We have to consider not only the ecology, but the culture. So many of the traditional owners that we work with make really clear to us that those, those edges of those waterways is where there are many cultural sites and artefacts, and we need to be really careful about protecting those and understanding ahead of time with our traditional owners what they want us to be doing across these landscapes to help them protect their culture and their cultural sites as well as the ecology. There's so many things to think about what the impacts of climate change and El Nino in particular are going to do. So we sit down and we work again with local experts with our traditional, the traditional owners of the, of the reserves where we work um, and our ecologists and staff to, to set up scenarios and understand what are we going to do when there's a very long prolonged drought? What are we going to do in the case of fire? What are we going to do? What are the management actions we need to put in place? And what are the things that are critical to protect in place? What are the things that are going to transition and we just have to monitor and try and guide that transition to be as functional as we possibly can? We need to have all of that information up front. So we've been working really hard, even through the good times, to understand what are the scenarios that we need to put in place and to have the tools ready to rock and roll when we need them, when those scenarios come to light. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Beck. And it must be so exciting to hear a new frog or a new frog on your territory. And as a bird watcher, seeing something really unique that you don't expect is amazing. But to be woken up at night or have a frog hopping at your feet you've never seen before, I think that will be a, a, a real treat. I have to say, Jodie was very excited and we, we're really looking forward to getting her out there. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we've talked about um, traditional owners and that really their understanding sits really deep in the DNA of Bush Heritage. And we've been able to take some really significant steps this year in how we manage the organization and how we deepen our cultural understanding and the way we work with traditional owners. Perhaps Heather, you can give us um, an update on what's been happening because it really is quite exciting. Yeah, no, look, thank you, Matthew. And it is exciting. I think the key thing to remember is we're on a journey. We're on a journey of learning and understanding and working together. And what has been great this year is a team from our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff went to Gama. Um, and you can see their beautiful smiling faces there representing mm -hmm. Bush Heritage. And they were able to connect them with Leanne Little, who used to be on our board. And to see all the connections that we could make and the, the conversations and the stories that you have when you're at somewhere like Gama and being able to just sit down there and, and be involved and really build out our knowledge base and be able to work together with others. So that was great. It was the first time that we'd actually been at, at Gama. And I understand that two of the team actually got up mm -hmm. and were involved with a couple of the, the dancers. Um, they, of course, unfortunately have said that we can't share any of that footage because they're mm -hmm. you know, a tad little self-conscious about it. But it's great to see them really mm -hmm. embracing and, and being involved with that. The other thing that we've done too, and it's, and it's not us or me as a you know the CEO of Bush Heritage, it's what the team have done. So our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, which is you know over 10 now, have come together as a workforce group. And we had a senior leadership team had traditionally had an Aboriginal person sitting on that team. And so I was going to go, okay, I'll you know, recruit for that role. And the, and the Aboriginal workforce group said, no, Heather, no, that's not appropriate. That's not our way of operating. And so they suggested to us a model where a group of them, the leaders within that workforce group, the natural leaders within that from around the country, then formed a leadership group. And it's that leadership group that sit collectively. So we have Stefina Sali, who's um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage from up in the northern part of the country. And she's based in Nillamboy, so right up the top. Uh, she's one of that team. We have Vicky Parsleys, who's on the coast of New South Wales. And unfortunately, she's had a few access issues with the, the rains, et cetera, that have occurred around the coast there. And we have Bruce Hammond, who's based in Adelaide. So to be able to have the three of them working together as a collective group and sitting with us as a senior leadership team is really just helping us to build our cultural competency, to actually work out how do we continue to deepen our relationships? How do we move forward? We've had amazing history of working with traditional owners on their managed land and working with traditional owners on the land that we have responsibility for managing. But how do we move forward? How do we continue that journey? So it's great to be on that journey with the team and to be embracing a different governance model. I'd also like to do a bit of a, a shout out here for Avelina Trago. I was so lucky this year to be out on her country. Avelina's a board member and she's a Waka Modeler woman. And so we were out at Pilanga celebrating the Waka Modeler native title determination. The determination had actually occurred last year, but couldn't have the celebration because of COVID. But to be out there with the elders, with the broader community, sitting in that red dirt in the sand dunes and understanding a bit more about the stories and listening deeply. And to be able to have Avelina, her mum, Isabel, mm. and Avelina's daughter was absolutely fantastic. And there's nothing like a 14-year-old telling you how you're actually really wrong with how you're determining which tracks are in the sand. I was terrible <laughs> at working out what was a bird and a lizard and all the rest. She was so great at going, no, Heather, no, 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 no. That's a snake because you can see how it moves. So it was, it was really good to be able to have that time out there and with another a board member, um, Philip Cornwall was able to join us and to be able to have that sense of, of celebration and how we can work together. So it's been an amazing year and I'm really looking forward to continuing the journey in 2023 and challenging ourselves to think differently about how we engage. Fantastic. Thank you. 
And just a quick reminder, if people have questions, please do put them in the chat function. Um, we've had one that's come through, I think, in the Q&A, um, which we did pick up. But if you'd like to put any questions in, please use the chat function at the bottom and we'll get to those in just a minute. Because the uh, penultimate area that uh, I'd love to explore with you both is how we're investing in the next generation of scientists and conservationists, because this year has seen a big expansion of our internships and scholarships, which have been a focus for quite a number of years. But in 2022, we've been able to formalize and expand this program um, with the launch of the Seeding the Future program for all early career scientists. Now, Beck, I know this has been one of your dreams, hasn't it? So, um, and a lot of people benefit from this program. So please do share your experiences of that. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, this has to be one of my great highlights of this year. I think we've always run an internship program and I'm really proud of so many of our interns uh, from, from yesteryear that are now working in CSIRO that have built their own communications uh, mechanisms of science communication specifically that are working in conservation agencies and government departments across the country and doing amazing things. We were very, very lucky uh, this year uh, to be approached by the Vincent Fairfax Family Foundation, who wanted to take a different approach. We've we've been very fortunate to be supported in these internships, giving people appropriate living wages um, as they're working for us, doing work for, for Bush Heritage, but expanding their knowledge and skills at the same time. But Vincent Fa Vincent. Fairfax Family Foundation wanted to take a slightly different approach and not just fund us for individual internship stipends, but take a really core approach and give us the resources to make sure that these young people, the next generation of conservation experts, are being invested in appropriately and we're giving them every inch of that learning and every inch of a really fantastic experience working within Bush Heritage that we can possibly do. Um, we were lucky enough to, to get that grant and um, really very grateful for this new way of thinking about how we support the next generation. We have three fantastic people who are now running this program alongside the science and conservation operations within Bush Heritage to make sure that Every intern, every PhD student, every placement student that we have in Bush Heritage is really getting the most out of working with us, but also connecting to other parts of the conservation sector, including government and, and other ENGOs. We're really excited. We've picked up, managed to pick up a number of interns that have gone through the, the, the process with us previously. They're now staff with Bush Heritage. And so we see the benefit of training people in our approach, um, making sure that we're building the skills that we need to see in the people that we want to hire in this very competitive employment scenario environment that we have right now and build more and more. And this is this is one of our great superstars, Saskia Gerhardy, who played a significant role in our Plains Wanderer uh, project, which again is, is an area that has benefited significantly from the increased rainfall of La Nina. And while we thought that there were probably uh, the estimated population of Plains Wanderers across South Australia was about 100, using new thermal technology for the identification of the Plains Wanderer, Sus Suskia and her supervisor, Dr. Graham Finlayson, found 103 uh, Plains Wanderers just on Book Matter. So, you know, with a combination of the really good conditions as well as a bit of new technology coming in and the dedicated staff to be able to look for these species, we have a much better understanding of their distribution and the potential for these species to be living across these landscapes. And these are the kinds of experiences we really want to see our interns and our PhD students um, gaining out on site. And I think the next exciting step is postdocs. So we're really investing significantly and thankfully the ARC has come out with a new mechanism for postdocs this year that are specifically industry-based. And we were inundated with people who really wanted to work with Bush Heritage. And I have to say, we did manage to get quite a few grants in. So I'm really hoping to see an influx of postdocs and take that through from into placement student, to intern, to PhD student and postdoc, but then also start looking at um, Beyond science, you know, these interns really play a significant role across many different parts of the organisation, communications, HR, traditional owner engagement, 
it, there's so much really a part of this organisation and it's it's wonderful to see these young people coming through. I think the other area that we're building now is taking advantage of so much of the skills and knowledge in our volunteer base. We have an incredible volunteer base that's always supported Bush Heritage, for which we're very grateful. And so much, there's so much to be aimed, I think, for a university student who is, to be honest, learning lots of really great things theoretically, but probably not getting a great deal of opportunity to get out on country. If we can pair those mentors that still have so much to give, they might be retired, they might still be working, but mostly working academics don't have time to spend a lot of time on additional mentorship roles. But if we can ask our volunteers to take on that mentorship role with young and eager, enthusiastic university students who want to really dig deep into an area of expertise where we might have a sage expert hiding in our volunteer ranks, we're really keen to build that, that SAGE program. I think that's going to be an exciting one for this year as well coming forward. Fantastic. Thanks, Beck. And it was lovely to see some of these young people that we are supporting with job experience at the Ecological Society of Australia conference last week in Wollongong, wasn't it? Doing, their, pres doing their presentations and uh, they were fantastic. Very, very inspiring. I almost wish I'd gone that path myself. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all <laughs> have this opportunity? And, and students just did an amazing job. They absolutely, every, every single one of them needs to be congratulated. And um, it was a lovely gathering with the supporters, including uh, Chris and Jeannie Grubb, who have obviously supported a lot of our PhD scholarships, as well as provided a lot of sage advice themselves around the, the kind of programs that they would be interested in supporting. So it's it was just a fantastic gathering to be able to pull the academics, the students, the staff, the supporters, everyone together. It was really, yes. really good. Wonderful. Well, let's. Um, I think we've wrapped up some of the major highlights of this year. Let's let's look forwards and perhaps to finish the formal part before we move into Q and A. Perhaps I can ask both of you, what are you both most looking forward to next year in two thousand and twenty three? Um, well, I might start, and, and I know I popped this up when we had the picture of the planes wanderer, and this is oops, put him there in the middle of the shot. Um, he sits on my desk. And he's obviously a soft toy, but it's the constant reminder of the amazingness of the environment we work in and our teams. And so I actually want to see one of these in the wild. So team, I'm coming to Borkamata to see one of these. But I think for me, the really most exciting thing about the coming year is actually continuing to reconnect with people. Just the power of inspiration you get with people out in the landscape. And so this year, being able to be up at Yorka, and that's the, the screen that's behind me. This is the creek down at Yorka and be out there with our board, to be out there with donors and volunteers, to be in places in the landscape and be able to hear the frogs, see the birds, understand the impact that we're having and to really celebrate the amazing contribution. So a humongous thank you to all of our supporters, our volunteers, our students and staff. What a phenomenal year it's been. It's going to be an even bigger one next year. And we'll have lots of exciting things, whether it be in some of the land purchase area. And yes, we're looking for stuff. Um, the work that we do in agriculture and being able to share more of the details on that and celebrate that. And also particularly the deepening relationship with Aboriginal partners. But for me, it's about connecting with people in the landscape. Fantastic. What about you, Beck? Thanks, that's Heather. I, I think I second all of those. Um, but I think really fundamentally, I'm going to pick up on the area that Heather mentioned most recently around the change to our leadership team. I think this is a real area of innovation that I'm excited to work within. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work with the Aboriginal leaders that we have in the organisation, not just up at the, the senior leadership team, but really throughout the entire organisation, but particularly working very, very closely with them to drive more and more cultural capability across the organisation. And Matt, you mentioned our right way approach, right way science approach that we um, generated and, and espoused a few years ago. And I really am keen to work with the leadership team to make sure that everybody understands what we mean when we talk about the right way science approach. That's not us telling everybody else that we've got it right and they've got it wrong. This is the way that our partners have told us that they want to be engaged, that they want to be dealt with and talked to and, and you know, brought into 
the opportunities to undertake science and conservation early on so that their knowledge is recognised, respected and protected and we can generate ideas together of how we go forward and really heal country for both the ecological and the cultural outcomes that we both aspire to. And I think there's there's quite a lot to bed down still in our own organisation um, within Bush Heritage to make that work and sing and make sure that we and communicating with the traditional owners of our reserves, of the reserves that we own, but also working with traditional owners on their own reserves, on, on their own country, on IPAs, making sure that we tip that power balance and we have that equity of decision making and, and community based decision making to make sure that we're really walking forward together. And equally, I think we we have many different organisations who've been asking for our advice on how we how we drive that forward and how we help them understand that and take that up in their own organisations. So I'm, I'm keen to learn together, not just with our Aboriginal workforce, but also with other organisations so that we can all build that capability together. Fantastic. Well, I hope next year does unfold with uh, those aspirations coming to pass. And um, let's now look at some of the questions that have been coming through while we've been talking. Um, but before we do that, we had a couple that came through before the webinar started. And I don't know whether these people are, were able to join, but um, the first one comes from Gail and it's asking about the 30 by 2030 uh, aspiration for 30% of land reserved for nature. Um, and what Bush Heritage's view is. And this was the declaration at the Montreal COP15 on biodiversity. Um, Beck, is that something you can talk to? Yes, I'm happy to. I'm sure Heather would, would like to say something as well. But I, I think it's a great start, to be honest. Mm. I think it's possibly still not enough. But I think 30% of terrestrial ecosystems and 30% of marine ecosystems is a really fantastic start. And it's wonderful to see the Australian government sign on to that without hesitation. And of course, we are doing everything we possibly can to, to contribute to that in all of our different models. So yes, we're looking to purchase more land and increase the amount of land that we own by white fella law and, and manage for conservation, partnering with Aboriginal groups and Aboriginal people on IPAs and on their land to, to um, further their conservation and cultural goals. But also getting back a little bit to what we were saying before, talking with different government agencies around how they measure the impact of that protection. What does and how do they define protection? What does um, a, a protected area really look like in terms of legislation, but also the impact that we hope that it's going to be having across the country? And how do we engage multiple different sectors, you know, mining, agriculture, um, uh, communities more generally in in overarching, in an overarching way of, of improving biodiversity writ large, not just in those protected areas, but also. Yeah, look, I, and I think I'd just like to add too, and, and you know, great, I agree with all of you know Beck's comments. I think the key thing uh, too is that we've all got a part to play, whether it be government, whether it be corporations, or independent organisations such as as ourselves with our amazing supporter base. So it's about every part of the community playing their part and being supportive of that 30% and making sure that it's representative of the different ecosystems around Australia. There's no point just having 30% of the country that's all one ecosystem type. We mm. actually need that representativeness around the country. Thank you for the, those answers. Um, the second question was um, from Jeff, who works in New South Wales with some of the Greens policies. And the question was really, What's our, do we have carbon credits and do we sell them? And I know that's something that does come up fairly frequently. So it'd be very useful to hear um, what the situation with that is. Heather, perhaps you can respond to that. Yeah, no, look, thank you, Matthew. And thank you very much for the question. Look, the, the key thing is, no, we don't basically sell carbon credits. There's a couple of small projects that we're you know, sort of looking at and investigating. But the key thing for us is we want to make sure that we get the biodiversity outcomes. So it's really important that carbon is linked to biodiversity outcomes. So we want biodiversity first, carbon second. But where we're predominantly looking at things is where we need to do some restoration work, but like Edie Garrop, that we can get the income from doing that in a way that gives us the biodiversity and the carbon, and that carbon income can help support the management of our reserves. There's a couple of other projects where we're looking at where we may generate some carbon credits. 
but that's early days and you know that's not our focus area we're active land managers and that's what we're really good at so that's what our, our focus is but what we're also really good at too is helping work with developing methods to make sure that the biodiversity is really key to how a lot of these calculations are done so we've got an amazing team that's involved with some carbon um, partners to really look at how you know biodiversity is built into that in a robust way fantastic thank you well now another another interesting question and it's posed as a challenge i guess it's from christine in brisbane which is how much control burning is too much which has a sort of assumption built into it that we might be doing too much control burning. I suspect the answer is probably there's a lot more burning that would have happened uh, pre-European times to manage the land. So, um, the, but the point was made is that uh, First Nations people did not have helicopters with incendiary devices, which are one of the modern tools to assist us. Um, and is there, can there be too much control burning? I think that's a really use, interesting question to pose. Anybody like to have a go at answering that one? I can, again, I can start and Heather can jump in. Mm. I think, sure, <laughs> there, there can always <laughs> be too much of anything. Um, but I think the fundamental rule of thumb that we, we always try and employ is understanding the landscape, um, the, the amount of mosaic burning or cool burning or, or preventative burning is going to be specific to every single landscape and every single ecosystem type. So we need to have a really in-depth understanding of those ecosystems and how they work. Often the greatest depth and wealth of that information comes from traditional owners, local, local experts in the area, but is often also a requirement to undertake an experimental overlay on top of that because we've changed the landscapes. We've changed it not only with climate change, which is really drying the landscapes and changing that fire behaviour and closing the window. Heather mentioned earlier about the tight window in, in North America for burning. As climate change expands and, and progresses, what we find is that the window for undertaking that burning is getting shorter and shorter, which is often why we need to have those helicopters and incendiaries at, at um, really extreme sort of mobility is because we've got a short window to do that burning, whereas the burning windows were probably much longer. The other thing, of course, is that we've introduced very lipid rich grasses across this country. And so understanding how they're going to burn, how long they're going to burn, what the risks are, what the environmental conditions are, what the weather conditions are on the day is all critically important to build in. So we work really closely wherever we possibly can uh, with traditional owners to make sure we're making taking advantage of the greatest knowledge across these areas to make sure that what we're doing is healing country and preventing those really extreme fires that we saw in 2019, um, but also making sure that we're taking that experimental approach and, and understanding the newer impacts that we've we've wrought on the country as well. Yeah, I, I think I'd just add to that too, and, and Beck, you touched on it a bit, is that this has been a managed landscape for 60,000 years. It's only in the last 250 that it hasn't been actively managed in the same way. So part of this is relearning how to utilize fire in the management of that landscape and, and be effectively an active forest manager in a lot of respects. Then also too as to how we use it both for managing the landscape, but also that prevention of wildfires. So we've already had one fire that would threaten one of our reserves this year. And the only reason why it actually stopped was because of the work that we do with the mosaic burning over many years for both the management of weeds on that property, but also the management then of areas where we know we're going to get lots of lightning strikes. It's you know one of those properties, it's actually Yorker that's sitting behind me, where we know we every year we're going to get a lot, a lot of lightning strikes. So that's part of the way of the management tools and techniques. I think the key thing is learning and continuing to listen and work with the traditional owners and listening to the land tell us how it needs to be burnt. Yes, I think that's a great point, Heather. And uh, there's a lot of ch a lot of conversations happening in the chat about it. It's a very complex area, but it's certainly one that we've put a lot more resources to in the last couple of years with a whole fire management team now, because as one of the panelists has pointed out, I'm sorry, not panelists, one of the people listening today, um, with three years of very wet 
uh, La Nina, we're now going to go into potentially drought or dry years. And of course, we have a huge buildup of uh, vegetation and that's going to present <clears throat> that fire team with some interesting challenges, isn't it, as they plan ahead to uh, mitigate against uh, disastrous wildfires, but to make sure we can continue the traditional practice of uh, mosaic burning, as well as obviously, you know, back burning to protect assets. So one question that did come in was in relationship to overseas was, do we have any organizations elsewhere in the world helping fundraise uh, and support Bush Heritage, which I know is a very easy answer in one country. Perhaps you can tell us about that, Heather. In one country, yes. So yeah. in the US, we have the Friends of Australian Bush Heritage Fund, which is an amazing organization, which is you know, an independent organization, but of those that love our work and help support us with you know, providing an opportunity under the US charity laws to have funds come through them, which they then look at the projects that, you know, they look to support. So a big thank you to that group of amazing board members, a small team over there in the US, and we're lucky to have their admin person, Virginia, who's uh, come across to have the Australian experience uh, for the next 12 months. So we're taking her out to reserves and giving her that really uh, opportunity to get to know Bush Heritage. But a big thank you to all of our donors from all over the world. We have those that are based in Europe. We have a cohort that's based in London. And I'm really looking forward to connecting in with people uh, now that the borders have you know, opened up a little bit and looking forward to also when people come back to Australia, being able to have the conversations and sharing the landscapes. And now that we have engagement properties like the Roundhouse, being able to take people up there, sit mm -hmm. on the hill, talk about how we can reconnect the landscapes, talk about our work, to have more volunteers out at Scottsdale the restoration work out there but uh, and there are amazing organizations our colleagues of conservation organizations around the globe are often our best advocates when people say to them oh who's doing stuff down in Australia and they know about us and our conservation colleagues here and they uh, they steer people to engage with us so thank you to all of you that are sharing the stories and connecting us in Yes, and thank you also to some of the people joining us today who are helping by answering some of the questions. There was a question about where are Plains Wanderers rather than just Bulkamata, you know, which is a dot in South Australia. So there's been some very helpful uh, responses to that. And uh, I'll add just add briefly to that question that was raised, which is they do have a traditional rain that actually got them up into southwest Queensland and the western parts of New South Wales, as well as Vic uh, and into South Australia. Um, but they're one of those birds that uh, seems to have benefited from the La Nina years. Um, and we're learning a lot about it. One of the interesting facts I learned from one of the presentations at the conference recently was um, they do have this nickname. We've been called the Goldilocks bird because they need a very precise, so we thought, um, amount of uh, grassland and shrublands to get just the right uh, amount of bare ground for, for feeding and nesting in. However, we've been finding them in some other places as well. So as always, uh, a change in climate, a change in weather, a change in surroundings. If you do more observation, we can learn so much more, which is why it's been wonderful to find that uh, we've now got 102 birds, I think it was, Beck, wasn't it, on Bulkamata, where the previous believed population in all of Victoria was about 100. So clearly, they've had a couple of very good years, and uh, there's a lot more out there. One of which I hope to see one day, as uh, the only one I've seen is Heather's, <laughs> Heather's toy to date. So um, thank you, everybody. I think that's pretty much most of the questions we've uh, had come through. And many thanks to everybody who's joined, uh, particularly some of the regulars who've been joining all the webinars this year. It's been absolutely wonderful. And we hope to have an equally exciting um, list of events and webinars next year. And I'm sure you'll see Beck and Heather joining me for some of those. And um, thank you, everybody, for a great year. And I hope you have a wonderful break and uh, festive season. And we look forward to seeing you all in the new year. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a safe festive season. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, everyone.